But we're going to see a dream, and then we're going to see a demand, and then we're going to see a decree, and then we're going to see divine direction. We're going to see all the normal things that happen in Babylon, except at the end, we're going to see something turn and change direction, and it's going to be the influence that God has over his four young men that he brought to Babylon. So the, it goes this way. Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a dream that's going to confuse and trouble him greatly. He's going to look to his counselors for what it means. He's not going to get any answers from them. So he goes into a fit of rage, and he orders the death of all the wise men in Babylon. That would include Daniel and his three friends. So when Daniel hears about it, he stands before the king and intercedes for the counselors in all of Babylon and goes to God for help. And that's really what we're going to look at today. And I think there's a cool picture painted there. Um, again, these, three, these four guys are put in a position of high authority with an, a king whose word is law, who has a very serious anger problem. Anybody ever have a boss with a serious anger problem? <laughs> and you've got to walk on eggshells? The cool thing about Daniel and his three friends, they had a boss with an anger problem. But they didn't walk on eggshells because they had a God who they knew was greater than the king's anger problem. And they begin to walk it out here at the beginning of this chapter, or these first 18 verses. So let's look at verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. So what, what happens here? What do you see? What stands out? It was probably a nightmare that woke him up. Yeah. More than a dream. <laughs> it was, a, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. He had a dangerous work that was not pleasing. Yep. That's, that's right. Yeah, you don't want a king who's tired <laughs> and angry. Yeah. yeah, whose word is law. Yep. You say to him, how'd you sleep last night, your majesty? Take that guy's head off. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so the first thing we see, says, now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, how long was Daniel's training? Okay, so this is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar. How's that possible? <laughs> yeah. It's, it says the second year of his reign, and it implies the second year of his rule by himself. For the first five years of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, which was his father, was still holding command, and he was having his son reign and king under his authority. So when they go through all the training, and Daniel's actually in his second year of serving Nebuchadnezzar, in, as one of his counselors. So his training ended three, five years ago, and he's now been serving the king for two years when this, this happens. So it's the second year of his complete full control, control of reign over, over the office that he has. Um, and it says here that he had dreams. Uh, you, your Bible may say dreamed dreams. It, it implies that he had many dreams, like the same dream, but many times over a long period of time, maybe like a few months. He kept having this dream, and it wasn't just one night. It was over and over, or maybe a couple nights would go by. He'd have it again, again, and again. And, and the dreams were all the same, but he just couldn't put any sense to it. And it says he was troubled by them, means troubled in his spirit. What it means, literally, he was deeply concerned that all these dreams that he was having really meant something important, and he couldn't put it together. And if you study anything about the Babylonian culture, which we, there are places to study it, the dreams meant a lot to them. And if you had a dream, they had people that would decipher your dream and tell you, give you direction for your life, and people would step in it because it meant a lot to them. But he's having this dream, and we know God gave him the dream, right? We know that from Daniel. But he's troubled. This means something, and I just can't make the connection with it. And he's really being uh, stirred up here uh, in, in a strong way. Um, you know, 
And this is not the king you want waking up agitated. After like two months of this, would you want to be the one who brought the king his coffee? <laughs> You're like, oh man, I'm not even going to say a word if he had come in. And it says that his sleep left him. It means he was being stirred not to sleep because of the effect the dreams were having on him. So he was now in fear and stirred not to sleep. You know, this means something. I don't get it. Something's not right, or I can't put it together. And if I sleep again, it's going to come upon me again, and, it, and it's shaken him to the core. And it, it, it's God giving him the dream, and it's occurring over and over again because God is showing him just how important this dream is. In all of Babylon... Who knows Nebuchadnezzar's true heart? God, who's in charge of all things. So God knows this guy with an anger problem needs to be agitated to the point where he's going to flip only because he knows it's really important and he can't get it together. Now, he's conquered how many lands by this time? All of them, everything. Could be in the back of his mind, he's thinking and maybe that I'm getting a dream and someone's going to come through my back door and try to conquer Babylon. And I just can't get it together. Now, we know Nebuchadnezzar was a great military genius. He was a smart guy. He was a good warrior. He was a fighter. Uh, he was a brilliant man. So for him to not piece it together, it's driving him out of his mind to the, to the point where he's not even uh, able to sleep um, and again, the Babylonian culture, dreams were so very important. Um, it would help them make choices for their future, help them make very important decisions for, for their life. And, and I think it's important to note, you know, we live in a dream-crowded culture. You can go into some spiritual bookstore today, probably even Christian bookstores, and find books on what your dreams mean. And as Christians, man... Don't chase a dream. What's that guy's name with the big, long Pope thing by the windmill? Don Quixote, right? <laughs> Don't chase a dream. Chase the Lord. I don't need to know what my dreams mean. You know why? I have the living word of God in front of me to give me direction. I have the truth of almighty God's direction for my life. It's right here. I have his Holy Spirit in me, encouraging me and comforting me as I trust God at his word as he gives me direction in my life. You know, so believers for us, we don't chase after dreams. Um, we, we have the Holy Spirit, and I think as we pray and we, we seek guidance from God, meditating on his word, even consulting spiritual leaders who teach us his word, I think that's how we make decisions today. And they should be made that way for us as believers. But Nebuchadnezzar, God knew this man. He knew his heart. He knew what he was doing. And he knew that he had to agitate this guy. I'm going way back to this thing here, but there's a guy I know back in Massachusetts who used to have a heart attack. And he was such a fighter. He was senior. <laughs> senior. And his job is people bring their dreams up to him. And he interprets them. Imagine that. Seek his word, seek his spirit. Yep. Seek spiritual leadership, true leadership that will give biblical counseling. Sure, absolutely. That's a shame, isn't that? That's a crying shame that people's lives are, are ruined. We don't chase dreams. We chase the Lord. We don't try to figure out what they mean. And I had a dream last night, and there was a fire truck there, and there was a guy on the fire truck, and he's spraying down the hose of the building exploded. I ended up with a pizza in my hand. Then what does it mean? It means you, well, you're hungry. You know, whatever. It you know, doesn't mean anything. It means the Lord's coming to take his church. You know, no, don't, don't, we don't chase that stuff. I open up God's word and I get clear direction from him. And, and we all should in that way. So God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream. It shakes the daylights out of this guy. He's a smart man. He's trying to figure it out. 
Is something coming against the kingdom? Is, is something coming against me? Maybe against my family? Is somebody trying to backdoor me and take over this? My, th my rule is thrown. He's only been there on his own alone for two years. So he's got a lot to think. His mind's racing right here. Look at verse 2. And the king gave orders to call in the magicians and the conjurers and the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, the command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you'll be torn from limb to limb and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time. And said, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm. That if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupting words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who could declare the matter. For the king, as much as, as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, or conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. See, there was a dream, now there's a demand. And what you have is an angry king who can't sleep. And he wants some answers. And he has spent years training his men on how to give him every answer he wants to hear. How to run his kingdom, how to run his economy, how to speak into people into the lives of the people that are overseeing the economy to make it grow. And he wants an answer here. So, so the king does really what any ruler would do and probably did exactly like his father would do. He calls his special advisors to help him understand the significance of this dream that was robbing him of his sleep. But this demand was no routine meeting because the king not only commanded them to interpret the dream, but also to reveal the dream to him. All right? Yeah, I can tell you my dream, and then you can tell me whatever you think and ruin my life. You know, like, like the guy Pete knows, ruining people's lives. He says, no, I, this is too important. This is important. I'm having it over and over. I'm being stirred. That's just what's in his heart. This may, be, this may affect the whole kingdom may affect my reign. I need to hear from you. And I want to hear the truth. So since you're so smart and you know everything, you tell me the dream I had and then give me the interpretation. And right away, no one can do that. You know, they, they lose their mind. Um, what Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand, that it was God who was giving him this dream. He did understand the dream was important but he didn't know it was coming from God Almighty. Lying awake, pondering on it, thinking about it, this dream was a tremendous agitation to him, he, and he wanted answers. Look at verse 3. He says, The king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Right? It means his dream had slipped out of his mind. That means he couldn't keep it together in his mind. He's probably trying to get pieces of it, but he couldn't retain the whole thing. He, he's trying to, I can't recollect it is really what he's saying. But he's confident that if he heard it again, he would know exactly what it was. So do you ever have a thought that's there? And, you know, if you've been married long enough, you're trying to get this thought across, 
and then your wife answers it for you, and, and then you go, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say uh, in that. That's, he's telling him that. I can't quite recollect it, but if you tell it to me, I'll know right away, nope, that was not my dream, or yes, that was it. So he stirred in that way. That's a, it's a really good question. These men are what we know in the New Testament as magi. So they're supposed to know. Yeah, yeah. They're the ones, the magi are the ones that came to find baby Jesus. They followed his star, mm -hmm. these wise men. They came from Babylon. Yeah, the magi were known as men in whom the gods gave deep and hidden things to. So they're supposed to know. They should have known. They should, they, they're supposed to be in tight with the gods. Yeah, he knew right away. They're in, trouble. They're in trouble. Something's off. And he's looking for an answer from them. He's looking for an answer through them. From who? Yeah, to him, it's the gods. You guys are supposed to know. Everybody knows the Magi receive deep, hidden things from the gods. So I, I need to know what it is. It's that important to me. They say it's the gods and not God. Right. Well, he... It, We'll see next week. He finds out exactly mm -hmm. who God is. Except God. Yeah. <laughs> God Almighty. These yep. captains are often set up as it's like watching God play a one man. Oh, yeah. Game, you know? <laughs> he sets it up for the fight. Oh, well, God's like, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, we're playing chess. Yeah. You can have all the pieces. I'm just going to take the queen. <laughs> and uh, it's all over, man. <laughs> you can play all day, but in the end, I win. And the truth is, no different for us. We press on. We really do. Sometimes we think, Lord, I just don't have it together. God's going, I'm the one playing the game. You're my, you're my peace. I moved you there. Oh, but I had free choice. I made the choice. God says, you made the choice. But my providential hand laid the foundation down for you to make that choice. And I knew it all along. That's why I picked you. An amazing thing. There. In verses 5 through 8, you know, it says, The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. You know, he says it. Anybody have a different wording there than that? Verse 5. My decision is firm. Yep. This thing is gone from me. Yep, that's important. How about verse 8? says, the king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm. Who has different wording there? Because you see, the thing is gone from me because you see that my word is sure. That's right. That's exactly right. So he's, he's seeing, because both of those in the Hebrew mean the same thing. So in verses 5 through 8, it speaks boldly of the demand of the king that he's making, he's making a judgment on his advisors. He's looking at them and he's saying, you don't even know. This thing's gone from me. And if you're in with the gods, you should know that. You should be able to come to me and say, your majesty, this thing's gone from you. It's firm. It's, it's resolved. Here it is. We're going to lay it out before you so you know what it is. So he's testing his counselors, and he realized that this dream contained significant message concerning him and his kingdom. So it must have brought fear and wonder to his heart as he thought about it. And the interpretation was too important to be treated as a routine matter. Um, he wanted to, to be sure that his wise men would give him the correct meaning because he believed it involved his future and the future of his kingdom. You know what he realizes here in verses uh, 3 and verses 5 and 8? He realizes these guys are not wise men. They're wise guys. And I'm looking for interpretation from God. And you're going to give me an interpretation of your own design for your glory. It's almost as Nebuchadnezzar saying, listen, I need the truth. I don't need your interpretation to make me feel good for your glory. You know, the world offers our children, and our friends, this false truth. Well, I believe 
400 million years ago, we evolved from slime off a rock. And the world sucks that up. And I don't need your theory. I don't need your interpretation of your own design for your own glory. At some time, everybody in this room said, I need the truth. I need the truth. And the truth is God created us about 8,000 years ago and had a plan for all of mankind to send his son to save us from our sin, from ourselves, to give us a brand new life. And we, we've chosen to walk in that, each one of us. So it's as if Nebuchadnezzar is saying, listen, I don't need your interpretation so that you can walk away glorified. I need the truth. That's why this demand from me is so strong. There's something very important going on here. And they're, believe it or not, they don't realize it, but they're pushing the wrong buttons for this guy because he's, he's about to lose it. You know, if the wise men could truly interpret the dream, then they could surely reveal to him what the dream was. So it was a test of their ability and their veracity. And what happens here is his counselors were greatly humiliated because they weren't able to tell him the dream. To them, they're thinking, this is a great opportunity to, to gain great wealth from the king. I might even get a promotion out of this. That's why they're stalling for time. If we push him the right way and stall for time, he might give us a little hint of the dream. Well, sir, can you remember anything? Well, there was a donkey in there, and, you know, then I saw a palm tree. And that was it, you know, and they're going to jump in. I'm looking for my own fame, and that's what they're all about. Um, so yet it's God setting the stage for Daniel to assure the king's heart and mind of his dream and of his authority. In the end, God is going to get the heart, win the heart, this king who has no idea who God Almighty is. And God is setting the stage for Daniel to do what Daniel has been called to do without him even realizing that. And that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, so, you know, as they plead their case, these wise men, they're trying to use flattery. They're trying to use logic. You know, oh, king, live forever. No one has ever asked such a hard thing or demanded that from anybody there. So they're trying to flatter him, trying to use uh, logic, but all their speeches are only making Nebuchadnezzar more angry, and, and he already had an anger problem. You know what I'm saying? You, don't, you just don't want to tick him off. Um, you know, throughout Bible history, you find many occasions when God exposes the foolishness of the world and the deceptiveness of Satan. If you remember Moses and Aaron uh, stood before the priest of Pharaoh and laid down their staff and it became a snake. And what did Pharaoh's priest do? Laid down their staff and it became a snake and then turned the Nile into blood and they turned the Nile into blood. And it kept. And then all of a sudden, the, the miracles were beyond them where they went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, you're fighting almighty God. Stop. And they couldn't touch. They couldn't do it. God exposed their foolishness. Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel. He's standing before the prophets of Baal. He says, okay, dig a, dig a trench and pour water in that thing and now call upon Baal and have him send fire down and eat up the sacrifice. Go ahead, call him down. Well, it says they called from morning till afternoon to the evening sacrifice. They're cutting their arms. They're crying out, Baal, Baal. Elijah's mocking them. Maybe he's using the bathroom. He can't hear you. He's mocking them. And God exposed their foolishness. They all ended up dead. Jeremiah confronted the false prophets of Judah. And he got hurt, but, but he confronted them face to face and boldly called them what they were. Paul exposed the deception of a sorcerer. We just read that uh, a few days ago. He just... This is, you know, you're an evil man. You're going to go blind. That guy went blind for three days and was, 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 was afraid. You know, so out of their own mouths, these wise men, they're condemning their own practice. Oh, king, live forever. You're going to be great. 
So, so this, this uh, dream, this demand that he gives, now in verse 12 and 13, leads to a decree. They've pushed his buttons long enough. Verse 12, because of this, the king became, what does it say? Indignant and very furious. Those are strong words right there. And gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. This is amazing here. So you have this decree. It goes forth with this king who's got an anger problem. It says he's indignant and very furious. Anybody have any different wording there in 12? Yeah, uh, indignant and furious, it means provoked to madness in a raging stream of violence. Think about that. He didn't just get mad. He was already mad. And his mad provoked him to madness. You know when someone loses their mind and they're angry? You just run for your life. Well, they can't go anywhere, and they caused it. He's provoked to madness, and that madness turns to a raging stream of violence. And he says he gave orders or he commanded. Um, you know, and it's an amazing thing. When you're brought to a provoking madness and a raging stream of violence, that's really never the time to give a command. You don't want to do that. The wrong time. And yet he gives this command, uh, destroy all the wise men uh, of Babylon. So not only destroy those men who are in his presence, but he's in such a raging fit, kill them all. Now, we just saw the end of chapter 1. What did he think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Top dogs. He thought the world of them. And all the officials there cared about them. And yet he's in a fit of rage. Never the time to give an order, ever. Go take five. Go take a walk. I don't care if you're the president of the United States or the king of Babylon. Sit down and take five. But God knew Nebuchadnezzar's anger problem. Uh, in verse 13, you know, the decree went forth. So this implies that they'd begun to kill all the wise men, and they were on their way to kill Daniel and his three friends. So they did start to kill wise men. And they probably didn't want to do that, but when you get a king with an anger problem, um, you just, you're in trouble. You do what he says. You know, the Hebrew word for anger means the violent passion of the mind excited by supposed injury. You understand that? The violent passion of the mind excited by supposed injury. Literally, to choke, to strangle in anguish, unchecked anger will be inflamed till it rises to rage and temporary delirium. That's, this, is the, this is what he had. That is the anger that this man had. And I get a few thoughts on anger because of it. And this is what I've learned in my life personally um, about anger. Uh, I've, I've been angry in my life, and I've known a lot of angry people who have wanted things their way, they didn't get it, and they exploded. And I've had it happen to me, uh, to my face. And, and I know people who were highly dignified that I considered professional that suddenly became very unprofessional in my eyes because of an anger problem. But number one, anger has an undignified way about it. Anger makes a person act in undignified ways because you're no longer in control. You've lost it. And you're not out of control in love. You're out of control in anger. And it makes, it, it makes, makes you undignified to everybody around you. Number two, anger has an unreasonable element. This king spent years training his wise men. He had a system. We saw it. We looked at it deeply. It was a system that worked. So these men who have been in the king's service for years, at least 
five years and maybe even in his father's service are only going to be killed because of an anger problem. So it has, it has an unreasonable element. Number three, anger has an undetermined influence on your witness. Anger shuts off the love of God from flowing between you and others. It shuts it off dead. That's what anger does. Number four, anger has an uncontrollable element. That means if you keep it unchecked, it makes very rapid progress. It escalates. And if you don't check it, it gets worse. And you know what? You're, it's all coming from the mind thinking of something. And it gets worse and worse until it blows up. And then once anger blows up, it sometimes prays to God that it really never did. Because, but it's too late. It's already come out. So anger has an uncontrollable element. And number five, anger has a very unhappy effect. Anger snuffs out the calm, holy light of the Spirit of God. I guess you could say anger, anger snuffs out the calm, holy light where the Spirit of God loves to dwell in the human heart. The Spirit of God dwells in my heart and possesses the love of God. And anger snuffs that love out. Doesn't remove his spirit from me but it snuffs out that love. You know, when anger was in Cain, uh, when it was inside his heart, murder was at his door. When we read that, you could say anger is a wind that blows out the lamp of the mind because it stops thinking. It just starts reacting. Proverbs 25, 28 says, whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city Broke with, with broken down walls. That's what it's like. So this king had an anger problem, but God knew about it. And he knew all about it. And, and he's got Daniel there. It's, it's amazing to me that Daniel and his three friends were really the top notch of all of them. So why didn't he go to them first? And what we don't know is we, we know that Daniel was in his room with his friends. So whoever the counselors were who were on duty that day woke up to their own death. But God had Daniel set apart for a purpose and a reason. So now they're killing the guard, they're killing the soothsayers and the magicians and the Chaldeans there. Get down to verse 14, and um, they're going to look for Daniel. It says, then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment, to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he said to Arioch, the king's commander, For what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and uh, Ezariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. So you have this dream that he has, then there's a demand, I want an answer, then they don't get, he doesn't get an answer, there's a decree that goes forth for their death, and then you have this divine direction from God. It's like God had set this whole thing up all along. And now here's Daniel. You know, um, What stands out to you in verses 14 through 18? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yep. Well, the king, even though he's angry, he still had a great respect for Daniel. And, and God put that in all of the officials' hearts. So, so this is God providentially working. And you know what? He did it with Esther, too. That was God providentially working. Set the whole thing up. It's great to see that, and that's a good point to bring up because it's, it's under the same rule. The whole Persian Empire, all the kings had anger problems. I mean, you didn't cross them. 
they'd take your life because they had this great authority. It almost seems like Daniel didn't know even what was going on. Right? He didn't. He had no idea what was going on. What's so urgent? Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah, he had no idea. He was in his room, yeah. which means, you know, each one, each group of officials that stood before the king came at different times. Remember when Haman came? It was his time to be in the court. Well, they had different times to be in the court. And when the king finally said something about his dream, whoever the officials were that were in the court <laughs> didn't make it through that day. That's for sure. And Daniel he had no idea what was going on. Uh, you know, I, I did read in one of the commentaries that I read that Daniel and his friends, their place where they lived was about a mile and a half from the palace. So, so they all didn't live right there. They had places where they lived, like little offices with homes type thing uh, or, or a room where they stayed. Daniel had the greatest prayer meeting on earth that night. Yeah. That's a guarantee. Yep. I think the leader up to that <laughs> prayer meeting was 16 there where he says, I desired of the king that he would give him time. Yeah, yeah. And that he would yeah. show the interpretation. He didn't say, tell me your dream and we'll make something up and look like we're really good. He yeah. said, give me time. Yep. And he will show all the positivity. There's even a backing up. We're going to see that in a second. He's backed up while he's there by Arioch, the guard, who the king has great respect for. Um, and the word also at this point had to be soft, softening the king's heart towards Daniel even more than it was before. Yeah, yeah. Or he would have been right there when he spoke up and said, give me a couple of minutes here, king. Yep. Well, let's look at it. It says, so the decree has to be obeyed. So you have this guy, Arioch, who's the commander of the officials. But the term official there means executioners. So this is, this is the commander of the executioners. And they go out and they begin to slay the wise men of the city. And if you read any history, you find out that Nebuchadnezzar really was very good friends with this commander. He had great respect for him because this guy followed his orders in a heartbeat. You tell me to kill somebody, his head's coming off before you finish your speaking. So Nebuchadnezzar had great respect for him in that. So this is a key guy. And he has this guy, God gave him, along with the other officials, respect for Daniel. So providentially, the one who's really working here is God. And he's working it out. Now this is a, a, a great way to see the providential hand of God working. Because this is how he does it, through his his servants, and through people around. So Arioch uh, came to Daniel and his friends, and his friend, Daniel was shocked to hear what was happening. The term, what you brought up, Dave, it means he was really shocked to hear it. Like, I can't believe what I'm hearing, you know? In, in, uh, in verse 14, it says, he replied with discretion and discernment. In, in, in the Hebrew there, it means answered with prudence and accountability. Strong wording, because it means in the same way that he spoke to the commander of the officials and to the overseeing uh, official that was over him, he spoke in humility, placing himself in a low position, while at the same time offering clear direction. Now, if the one thing this guy Arioch wants to hear from Daniel is, I don't want to hear pride from you, your head's gone. I want to know what to do, because I know this is not right. But I cannot disobey the command of the king unless you, Daniel, give me clear direction. So this is what's happening, and that's what's, what's really going on. So in a discreet manner, using soft, gentle language, humbly and modestly inquiring, what is the meaning of all this, while at the same time offering a way to render it? In verse 15, you know, he said to Arioch, the king's commander, What's the reason for the decree? Why so urgent? So he informs Daniel, tells him all about it. Daniel made a request to go see the king, you know. So Daniel's question is, really, why, what is the cause of the king being so cruel? That's what he means. Like, I know him to be angry, but why this cruel? And Arioch made the whole thing clear to Daniel, which means he didn't want to really kill anybody, 
because he knew the king's anger problem and the king was enraged, but he was kind of looking for Daniel for some kind of hope and he just found it right there. This is what's happening. Yes, I understand, Daniel says. So verse 16, Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. So by the providence of God, Arioch's heart was wrought by God, and he would be the one. Daniel just didn't have authority to walk into the king's presence. He had to go in there with Arioch. So Arioch is disobeying the king's command by bringing Daniel to him, but he has a hope in his heart that this man has the answer this king is looking for. So he works this whole thing out. So Daniel's brought into the presence of the king, and he lays out his request, and Nebuchadnezzar listens to him. Amazingly, that's the hand of God at work there. One thing Nebuchadnezzar wants to know, what does this dream mean? And it doesn't make sense to me. I can't put it together. It's out of my mind. I need an answer. And the men he went to could not give him an answer, and because they were pressing they, were, they weren't pressing for time like Daniel was pressing for time. They were actually pushing his buttons, trying to get him to do things their way. They wanted him to say something about it so they could give him an answer and get wealth from it or promotion. Uh, but yet Daniel was, uh, Daniel knew how to speak to the king. And God gave him that gift. And it's an amazing thing because there's a way to talk to someone and at the same time trust the Lord for the outcome. There is a way to speak to someone who's in a fit of rage and trust God at the same time for the outcome. Daniel had the courage to speak to Arioch. Then he had the courage to request permission to speak to the king about the matter. That gave Arioch hope, enough hope that Arioch was disobeying the king's command and he was listening to Daniel's. So we know that God was governing over the whole thing, and so did Daniel. That's what the key here is. Daniel knew. You know, probably uh, thinking, maybe this is why you brought us here. Maybe the reason why you brought us here was to keep the wise men in Babylon alive. Maybe all that three years of training, maybe all that time of not eating anything but vegetables, maybe, maybe all of this was for this one thing, Lord. Daniel has no idea what tomorrow holds. He has no idea God's going to speak to him about visions of the future and, and what's going to happen to the world and the Antichrist and all that this book holds. He just knows here, now, could be you brought us here for this specific time so he had the courage to say something to Arioch. he had the courage to trust god who was truly overseeing this he was trusting god by faith uh, that he had bought, been brought to babylon to be a light to the gentiles and then you get to 17 so daniel goes to his house and informs his friends hananiah michelle azariah about the matter you know, so they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. So Daniel goes to his house to be with his friends. They all sought the Lord in prayer. Probably the greatest prayer meeting anybody in Israel ever had at this time right here. Just, you're our only hope, Lord. And we trust you. We've trusted you for three years of training. We've trusted you for two years in the king's service. We trust that when we woke up this morning, we weren't on duty. Someone else was. You have a purpose here. You have a plan. I can see your hand providentially working. We're going to come before you. They request mercy from God. They request compassion from God concerning this mystery to them. Lord, show us what this is. Show us the dream. Show us the interpretation of it, um, so they and the rest of the wise men of Babylon would not be destroyed. In fact, it says, requesting compassion from the God of heaven. You know, it's, it means believing that God had sent them to Babylon maybe for this one purpose. 
So they needed the mercy of God to have com the compassion of God to lay this thing down before the king. This is not a king you walk before in pride. It's a king you walk before in great humility. But that humility cannot lack authority. And they have the authority of God on their side. And again, the authority of God is not human pride. It's human humility. That is the authority of God. So they would, they're going to go. They're showing honor to the, to the Lord God Almighty of heaven. And they ask for this compassion to, concerning this mystery. So that their, their question to him or their request from him is to reveal that which they fully understand that they don't know. Lord, the one thing we are sure of, we have no idea what this dream is. And we have no idea what its interpretation is. In fact, if you were to tell us the dream and you don't give us the interpretation, we're just as dead as, as we are right now. We're wholly trusting you completely. Um, but we believe you've brought us here to save the lives of all these wives, men, from the wrath of the king. So, so the amazing thing, I think, is that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar took his problems to bed. Daniel took his problems to God. And that's what makes the difference. We take them to the Lord. We don't take them to our friends. We don't take them to down the street. We don't take them to bed. We take them to him. He has the answer, whether we like it or not. God could have said to Daniel, this is the dream, and this is the interpretation. Yes, the three of you, three of you, I won't tell you which one, are going to lose your heads. He doesn't know what the interpretation is going to be. We trust you that you've brought us here for this reason. And so we lay it all down when we come before you. That's why the greatest thing here is that Daniel knows where to take this problem. And he takes it with his friends to the Lord. It, and it makes the end result just complete. You know, Nebuchadnezzar sought direction from wise men. Daniel sought divine direction from God because Daniel understood that he is truly the one in charge. And he trusted God enough to believe him at that. So I thought it was important to look at this before we start getting into the dream and its interpretation and then we start to look at all the different prophetic things. There are some character issues and some moral issues that God, I think, is revealing to us in chapters 1 and this part of chapter 2. It was like this. How do we talk to each other? How about when one person's angry and another person's not, how do we talk to each other to to calm that effect? Whether we bring our issues, that we just talk about them to more and more and more people because maybe somebody has the answer or we just need to get it off our chest. You can get a lot off your chest if you talk to God. And if you trust him, you'll have a greater answer in the end of it than you will have ever had from any person you'll ever know because we go to him with that. So, in this part of the chapter, two things stand out to me very strongly. Number one, never underestimate the power of prayer. Never. Because God already knows the outcome of all things. Yet he commands us to pray. And that forces us to trust him in, in, in doing things his way. And then he blesses us. So never underestimate the power of prayer. It also gives us a chance to, take, to talk with God about certain subjects and our communication with him pleases him. He wants me to talk to him. It, it pleases him when I do in that. And that power of prayer, it encourages us to see answered prayer and then equips us to trust him even more. You know, the one thing we've, for some reason, we just got kind of dwindled away from our prayer time on Sunday. I know we've been busy and things get caught up. But, man, we used to see some awesome answered prayer. And it was such a blessing to, to bring that before God. And, and we've got to start that back up. But see how easy we can just drift without even thinking twice about it. Well, it's easy to pray at church. Well, it's easy to pray at Dave's house. Well, that shouldn't even be a question. 
It should be, this is the time of prayer. If you can make it, make it. If you can't, pray at home. But go before God. Because we get that answered prayer, and it encourages me. Lord, you answered that prayer. You heard us. And you did something about it. And it equips me to press on even more. So never underestimate the power of prayer. And number two, never underestimate the providence of God. You know that God has you right where he wants you? You may say, nah, no way. <laughs> I'm living in this mess. It's a, you have no idea the troubles I face every day. He's got you right where he wants you. Nobody else can be there. Only you. And you're there for a purpose and a reason. So what? In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your circumstance, your situation, look to him and trust in him when you don't understand what's going on around you or you don't understand what's happening in the circumstances before you. He's got you there. Turn to him. His providential hand has us right where we are. And we can trust him just the way Daniel did. When the, maybe some guard's going to knock on your door. Hey, the, everybody has to die. Oh, 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 wait a minute, you know. Answer with discernment and prudence and humility. You know, I know someone greater than that anger. And he knows what he's doing. And could be that it just so happens that you came knocking on my door because of his mighty hand. Because he knows I'm going to run to him for help. And he's got the answer. I remember the story Pete told me one time years ago. Uh, he was at home, and, and the phone rang, and he picked it up. And the guy's like, hey, is Jim there? And Pete's like, no, there's no Jim here. The guy's like, oh, got the wrong number. Pete's like, wait a minute. Are you sure you have the wrong number? The guy's like, absolutely. I don't know uh, who you are. He's like, well, God does. And he, he began to share the gospel with the guy. And he's telling them all, yeah, God has you call me because he knew I was going to talk to you. <laughs> I'll never forget that story. It's an amazing thing. It's just the providential hand of God. You're at the gas station pumping gas, and you bump into somebody you haven't seen in forever. Providential hand of God. God's saying, talk to him. Plant a seed. He's prepped. He's ready. She's ready. Say it. Then love them and move on. Because God knows exactly what he's doing. So he's got you right where he wants you. Look to him. Trust him when you don't know what's going on. And then secondly in that, you know, don't underestimate the providence of God. He has a plan. Look to his direction for your life. And he will lead you right where he wants you to be. You know why? So you can accomplish his will. Simple as that. He's got a plan. I remember one time I was bleeding in my stomach and out the back, and I had no idea what was going on. And I'm like, man, i got to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor, uh, Dr. Linder. And I'm sitting there, and, and he's like, what is it? I, go, I have no idea. I'm bleeding real bad. I don't know what it is. He's like, well, let's just check you out. And we're talking. And, and he's like, so you're the pastor at Calvary Chapel? I'm like, yeah. And then after talking for a little bit, I'm like, you're Jewish. Yeah. I go, so, I know why I'm here. <laughs> God had me bleed to bring me to your office. So I got a question for you. You're Jewish. You hold on to your religious ceremonies and orthodox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you do to be saved? You can't. When's the last time you sacrificed a lamb? Well, we're not allowed to do that. All right. When's the last time blood was shed for you to be forgiven? Well, we, we're not allowed to do that. So how are your sins forgiven? Well, I go on the mission field and as a doctor and I support this and I support that. And yet, yet the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. I said, you know why they call Jesus the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Because he's the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His blood was shed for you to be forgiven. He said, I'm going to look into that. I said, I hope you do. And guess what I stopped doing? Bleeding. And I'm like, if that's how you work, what's that to me? I also stopped drinking milk, but that's beside the point. 
whatever the case is. The providential, never underestimate the power of prayer and never underestimate the providence of God because they work together in every human heart. And Daniel's life and, and his three friends over and over and over are going to prove that to us in this book. I think more so than as we look at prophetic events in the last days, we're going to see the providential hand of God holding a man and a, and a few men and using them to show the world around them his greatness. And, and no different for us in that. Dave? I'm sure. Absolutely. Well, they certainly knew how to pray. Yeah. And they knew what to pray for. So and they, knew who to pray and they knew who to pray to. Yep. So good word tonight. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to spend in your word. Lord, drive your word home into every heart that hears it. Let it accomplish your purpose. Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit so that it might take root and grow deep that the enemy could not steal it away. And let it begin to bear fruit, Lord. Let it reveal, again, our need to trust your Son, our need to look to you, to find our rest in you, our peace in you, our future in you. Just lead us by your providential hand, by your word, by your spirit. Just have your way in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.